Good morning. It sure is good to have you here with us at Beach Church Live. We're glad to, uh, that you were willing to come and, and worship with us. Please understand that we really wish that we could all join together right now, but because of the coronavirus, we recognize that we can't do that. However, we do want you to understand, likewise, this is a worship service. We know that most of us in the car are going to sing along with the radio, whether there's anybody in the car with us or not. Well, today, if you will, please join with us in singing along with the hymns. We're going to make sure that you've got the words available. We're going to make sure that, uh, that this service is an opportunity for you to be able to uh, participate just like you would in a normal worship service. The other thing that I would like to go ahead and ask is that whenever you are going throughout your week this week, that you spend time in prayer, not just by yourself, but with your family and with, you, yeah, with others, that you would spend time in prayer asking for God's guidance throughout this whole journey. It's not just about healing from the coronavirus, but indeed about our entire way of life needing to be turned back toward our creator, toward our savior. We thank you again for being here. If you will, please join us now in worship. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. In this difficult time, we need to be able to persevere. I'm going to read a call to perseverance from the book of Jude, verse 17 through 25. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 40. It's titled, A New Covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, say, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, Who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and stars for a light by night? Who disturbs the seas? and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, 
I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hanel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill Gareb. Then it shall turn toward Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes, and all the fields as far as Brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down any more forever. Amen. Psalm 91 Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray in these times of uncertainty and worry that we not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be known to you. Father, may your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Help us to rejoice in you always. Let our gentleness and kindness be evident to all. May we know that you are near. Please help us not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation to present our request to you, Lord, doing so with thanksgiving. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds. We thank you for giving us your word for comfort and for strength. And we pray your scriptures back to you. We lift up our eyes to the hills and ask from where does our help come? Yet we know it comes from you, Lord, who made heaven and earth. You will not let our foot be moved. 
We know that as the one who keeps us, you will not slumber. Behold, Lord, we know you keep Israel and all nations that will seek you, and that you will neither slumber nor sleep. Lord, you are our keeper, and Lord, you are the shade on our right hand. And we know that through you the sun shall not strike us by day, nor the moon by night. Lord, we know you will keep us from all evil, and you will keep our very lives. Father, we thank you for keeping our going out and our coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Thank you for all that you have done in this time of unrest of unknown you are the same yesterday today and forever and that lord you have promised in your word in the book of romans in chapter 8 verses 26 that you have sent us the holy spirit who helps us in our weakness for we don't even know how to pray as we should but you have sent the holy spirit himself who will intercede for us with groanings too deep for words And he searches our hearts and knows what's on our mind and in our spirit. And he intercedes for us because we are your saints and we will do the will of God. And you remind us that you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. And for those who we, you foreknew, you predestined to become conformed to the image of your son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Lord, you have predestined us, you have called us, and those you have called, you have justified, and those who you have justified, we will be glorified. When then shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but you delivered him over for us all. How will it not be that for him we will freely be given all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the only one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, was he raised who is in the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or coronavirus, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly have conquered them through Jesus, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, that is the good news, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And you gave us your Son, to justify us, to glorify us. In your name we pray, amen. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, kids. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. Well, everybody out there, you can tell we're not in the church building right now. I'm actually at our farm on Saturday recording this because we don't have the chance to be together this week in person at the church building. But you know what? Even if we're not together in person, this is still a great opportunity for us to worship and learn more about an amazing God. And you know, the world may seem to be a little crazy right now, but God is still in control. And even though things are going a little different, that's okay because God still knows that this is his world and we're his people and we know that and we can worship him. And you know what? I got to wear my hat today too, which is kind of fun. David and Jessica, I don't want to hear about this later, okay? All right. So I know that a lot of us probably didn't pay too much attention to this this past week, but it was the first day of spring on Thursday. And it was a little warmer this week, right? Yeah? And even though it seems it's never going to stop raining, we know that the sun and the rain and the warmer temperatures are all part of what makes spring come together and so that we have all the beautiful things that occur in spring, right? And you know, today it seems like the sun's almost trying to peek through a little bit, but it's still pretty cloudy. But Miss Barbara's the one running the camera right now. And I'm going to ask her if she'll take a look around real quick. There's actually some flowers and some green stuff on the ground starting to come up. And she can kind of take that down and show that to you guys down there. And that's a sign of spring. And we know that every year spring comes around and it's something that's absolutely beautiful. And you know, do you guys remember what season we're in right now? Church. What other season of the church? Lent. Of Lent, that's right. And Lent is a really old word that has its roots or its meaning that it started with in the meaning of the start of spring or the season of spring. And so we know that Lent is our time to prepare our hearts and our minds for Easter. And we know that Lent kind of means spring. So isn't it perfect to let spring teach us a couple lessons, right? Mm -hmm. So the next couple weeks, I know we're still supposed to talk about almsgiving and we will get to that before Lent's over. But we're going to talk a little bit about how spring can teach us some lessons, okay? So, Miss Barbara, will you pan the camera back over on that side? And I want you guys to look. The trees around us are all kind of bare and kind of dead and ugly still, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know, let's have her though look here at this flower right over here instead, okay? There's a couple flowers really close to her and there's one right over here to her right. That's so pretty and there's some more over there. So you see those flowers are kind of blooming and looking really beautiful? Well, that means that it's starting to show us some really beautiful things, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exam an example of what God does in our lives. He takes what was there before, which is like the ugly trees and all the dead that's around us. And he takes those things that are ugly and wrong and that we just see as dead. Those are our mistakes and our sins and our fears. And he turns it into something absolutely beautiful like that flower. And that's a reflection of his glory. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, that therefore if anyone is in Christ, he or she, girls, is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that awesome? When we trust in Jesus to be our savior, guys, we become brand new, just like that new flower or the new budding on that tree back there. We know that sort of like these plants do, that when Jesus is our savior, we transform from ugly and dead to beautiful and full of life. And that is all because of the love of Jesus. And that makes me even more excited to see spring every single year because it reminds me of what Jesus did in my life and in all of our lives that trust in him. So normally about now, I'd say something to kind of wrap up the message about how it's, you know, a beautiful spring day and we are so thankful that God transforms us like the flower and then send you guys downstairs. But there's no downstairs here. There's no children's church today. So I'm going to say before we have our prayer that I'm going to remind you about something of last week that we talked about. Having people around the world praying is an awesome and wonderful thing. But having kids praying for our world right now is unbelievably amazing. And it's so powerful. And the Bible says, and I told you guys this last year, Jesus says in the Bible, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. 
For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. And Jesus knows how special each one of you are, and he wants to talk to you. And I know that this morning is a little different, that we're not all together. And I'm so happy I've got my kids with me. But all of you guys that are watching this on Facebook, I don't get to see you in person. And every Sunday morning, it's such a joy to have all you guys come up around me and hang out while we do a message. But I do want you to remember that not only does our family love you guys and the whole church family loves you guys and misses you terribly, but we will be back together again soon because God loves us and takes care of us more than anything we could ever imagine. All right? So let's do our prayer and then we'll head off camera because there's no downstairs. All right? And my kids, you can repeat after me just like we do on Sundays, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for letting us talk to you. Thank you for making us new when we trust in you. Please heal the sick. Please keep us healthy. Please help the scientists, the nurses and doctors, and all of our leaders. But we know that you are in control. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, everybody. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Held with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join with me in the reading of the Word of God. Here at Beach Church, we in reflection upon the scripture from the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, it says that whenever Ezra opened up the book, all of the people stood. And so here at Beach, in honor of the word of God, we stand together for the reading of the word of God. I'd like to invite you to do the exact same thing with us today, even though it might seem a little bit strange to do so in your own home. I also wanted to let you know that at the end of the reading, I'll say this is the word of God for the people of God. The response is, thanks be to God. So now, if you will, join with me in the reading of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Beginning at verse 13, When I shut up heaven 
and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you will, please join with me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come before you today. We ask God that you would be exalted in and through our lives. In the midst of the craziness in the world around us, Lord, we ask that you would help us to listen to who you are, listen to what you have said, to follow you with our whole heart. Gracious God, may we be your people called by your name. May we seek you each and every day. May we as your people turn away from that which we have done and turn solely toward you. Father, this morning I ask that you would speak through me and if I fail to yield to your spirit, please speak to the hearts of your people who are listening today. And May they have a heart for you. May they know truth from error. May they bring before me my error so that I might turn back toward you. May I teach faithfully. May I teach your people in faithfulness and in truth. We thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, I wanted you to be thinking today, what exactly does it mean here in these verses, if my people who are called by my name Actually, I want to even step back before that. For verse 13 says, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Those seem like some pretty hard things. And in our world today where God is taught to be love, and taught to be so kind, Maybe our struggle is that we hear these things and the God of the Old Testament doesn't seem to meet up with the God of the New Testament. Well, maybe we need to change our way of looking at things. Does a parent that takes away a toy from a child whenever the child is misusing the toy, is that parent mean or unloving? If the parent chastises a child, even by spankings, whenever that child is, is out of line and even possibly going to do something that's going to get them or someone else hurt, is that parent out of line, unkind, or unloving? My hope is that you would not say, yes, they are being unkind and unloving, but rather that you would see that the heart of that parent is seeking to do what they can to love their child. So I wanted, to, I wanted you to sort of think about this with me. Here, I actually have a toolbox. And within a toolbox, generally, are all kinds of different tools. Here at Beach, we do keep a, a toolbox. So uh, I have a tape measure. Tape measure is great for measuring things, but it wouldn't do very well in maybe trying to get a screw into some wood. Likewise, we have... A hammer. A hammer is great for being able to drive in nails, but it doesn't do a very good job for maybe removing paint off of a wall like what a scraper would. God uses various things to try and get across to his people and even to the rest of the world who he is. And not just who he is, but how we maybe have moved away from him and how we need to be drawn back into right relationship with them. If you look at these different things, what you find is that God is using different options, if you will, different things to punish so that the children might be turned back to him. In fact, Scripture says that God has no pleasure, takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's pretty sad whenever people think that God is just looking for every opportunity to try and harm people, 
to try and just lay the hammer down upon them. God's not looking for an opportunity to point out where we've gone wrong. Instead, God is looking for opportunities to draw you to himself. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, if I remember correctly, says, Jesus is talking and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come in to him and sup with him, and he with me. Now, whether you realize it or not, that's actually Jesus talking to believers, people that are a part of the church. And so maybe it's something for us to really start considering that God is trying to reach out and get the church, get those that are a part of his church to actually listen to him. So let's look at this scripture again. Where was it that, that God was saying these things? Well, Solomon had just finished up this commissioning prayer, if you will, over the temple that he had had built for the Lord. It was a beautiful temple. It was immaculate, covered in gold and silver and bronze. It was a sight to be seen that many of us would love to be able to see. After Solomon had finished praying this amazing prayer before God, God comes to Solomon, if I remember correctly, a second time. And he says these words. After having said if, uh, that, I, uh, that God had heard his prayer, he follows up, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain. Well, there's one option for trying to chastise the children to say, listen to me, turn back to me. And then it, uh, it, the next one is, or I command the locust to devour the land. Hunger would have, been something that would have been associated with this because they wouldn't have had as much food to eat. Or send pestilence among my people. Now, if you read the NIV version, it actually calls this a plague. There were numerous times in the Old Testament where plagues would come, upon, uh, come among the people and they would begin praying and seeking God's help. Again, then we enter into verse 14. If my people... That should make us stop and think for just a minute. Who are the people of God? There's this, this common conception amongst the world today that everyone is a child of God. The problem is that that's not what Scripture says. The book of John, the gospel according to John, chapter 1, verse 12, if I remember the verse correctly, says that he gives right to become children of God to those who believe. In fact, likewise, the book of Romans actually gives this idea that we are adopted and then again in the Gospels, Jesus tells the Pharisees that they are sons of their father, the devil. Again, I'm not trying to be hard on these things. Instead, we need to understand that, that not everyone is destined for heaven. And, and that's a scary thing. And we need to be sharing the good news of Jesus with others so that we can be bringing others into the family of God. But it also helps us to understand that there is a group of people that are known as a people of God. If my people. In the Old Testament, it was the Jews, and they still do have a special place in the kingdom of God. But in the New Testament, it is those who are called by Jesus' name. Those who are followers of Jesus, who are the ones who are a part of the kingdom. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This means yes, this means no. 
And that might mean that you're sleeping right now. I hope that that's not the case. I was actually challenged by one of my elders to see if I could include that in, in the message today. So nonetheless, here there are a group of people that are called the people of God. If my people who are called by my name. Well, let me step off for just a minute here and look at that, uh, that portion of the verse. My people who are called by my name. My name is Jeffrey Wayne DeWeese. My dad's name is Herbert DeWeese. I'm not going to give you his entire name. But nonetheless, do you hear a commonality? My people who are called by my name. Well, as it turns out, I am called by my father's name. In fact, my brother is even more directly called by my father's name because he too has the name of Herb DeWeese. But if you hear it, I am part of the DeWeese line, just as my children have, I carry my name with them. And thereby, they are associated with me. The children of Israel were identified as people under whom, or uh, who were under the authority of Yahweh, the one true living God, the one who had created the heavens and the earth. They were called by him. They were associated with him. So thereby, they likewise were called to not take his name in vain. You remember the Ten Commandments. That was actually the third one. God says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And if indeed that's the case, then it might mean that it's not just about the use of language don't get me wrong, it's important for us to actually think about the words that we're using and to not use God's name inappropriately. But likewise, our actions convey about who we are and whose we are. So whenever I was younger, it was my responsibility to carry about my life in such a way that would not reflect poorly upon my parents. And likewise, it is my children's responsibility right now to live a life in which they are honoring their parents, which goes along with the, actually not fourth, but fifth command. So believe it or not, our actions carry deeper and more meaningful um, things than what we oftentimes think. The book of Proverbs helps us to understand this a little bit uh, more deeply as well. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Did you hear it? Lest I steal or lest I say who is God denying the Lord the idea there is not just in word but in action either way it could be dishonoring to the Lord so again how is it that you're carrying about throughout your life so then we come a little bit further. If my people who are called by my name, what is our response after that? Because we now know that indeed if we are followers of Jesus, we bear the name of Jesus Christ, now we have a responsibility to go forward. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Humbling ourselves requires that we must engage in some form of action or activity. What the idea is, is that we recognize that we are not the sole authority over ourselves. That we have someone above us. Someone with greater authority than we have. 
And indeed, we turn and we have an, act, an action or a response to the recognition of that one that is greater than us. And I will do my best to come back to that here shortly. But our next thing is that we humble ourselves and pray. Praying is truly bringing before God who we are and what we are and letting him know what is within our hearts. But likewise, trying to align our thoughts and our heart with him. And the only way that we can know what is his heart and his thought is not what feels good to us, but to look into his word and see what it is that he has said. We're told by the Apostle Paul to be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, to present our request before the Lord. So here, we need to to lay ourselves down. We need to look into God's word and see what, what it is that is uh, the best way to align ourselves with him. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Again, this requires us to get into his word, to seek out what it is that he is saying. And to not just have this mental assent or knowledge of who he is, but to carry on forward and to, to go forward with what we learn through his word. We learn that we are to love the Lord your God with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourself. And so thereby, that's what we are called to do. How much do you love your neighbor? Are you reaching out, if you're well right now, to see who you can help and what you can do to help out? If you're sick, are you unconcerned with other people and just going and doing whatever it is that you want to do? Not worrying about whether or not you are exposing someone. Look, I'm not trying to chastise anybody for what we're doing. But I guess I'm wanting, wondering, are we thinking of others as we would think of ourselves? Because a lot of times we think, what would I, what do I want to do? And we sort of satisfy what our immediate desire is. But then if we find out that someone else is not doing well, we get upset. And those two don't match up. So then we move forward in the scripture. First we are called to humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face. And then we're supposed to turn from our wicked ways. I thought about trying to have a mirror mounted up here and, and maybe turning and looking at it so that you could see my face in the mirror. But that really wouldn't get the idea across very well. If my people who are called by my, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I was, uh, I was at the doctor's office, the eye doctor's office, just a couple of days ago. And while I was being examined, they stopped for just a moment and said, all right, I want you to look at my nose. So I looked at their nose. Of course, they had me covering an eye. And they said, tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. And so they were putting up fingers uh, one side or the other. And of course, before they would move, I would have to tell them how many fingers they were holding up while not taking my eyes off of their nose. We have amazing, uh, an amazing gift of God called peripheral vision. And peripheral vision allows us to see beyond just what is directly in front of us. It allows us to see in a larger area. And some people actually have true tunnel vision to where they cannot see beyond that front area. But a good portion of us, the vast majority of the world, actually has a broader range that they can see. Within Scripture, we're called 
to repent of our sins. Repent literally means that we're walking one direction. And when we realize that we're going the wrong way, we turn around and go the other way. Now, here's the interesting dynamic. God calls us in the first part to turn from our wicked way, or to to turn and seek his face, right? To humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. At that point, we actually have to turn away from our own desires and turn toward him to seek who he is. But it's a little bit more than that because, see, when we turn toward God, unfortunately, we don't turn all the way. We have to turn and and look and say, I will turn from my wicked ways. So instead of having sort of a, a shoulder turned back toward our old way of life, to where in our peripheral vision we can see that old way of life, we need to turn toward God and look directly at Him and seek His face. Having now turned away from our wicked ways, that doesn't mean that we're never going to get it wrong. It doesn't mean that we're never going to sin again. In fact, the, the believers, actually the, the people of God, the Israelites, were called not to turn to the right hand or to the left, but rather to stay on the road following God with all that they could. That didn't mean that they couldn't see what was to the right hand or to the left. Sometimes we're going to be lured back into some of our old habits and and we've got to do our best to follow him faithfully. That means stay turned away from those wicked ways. But when we fall, we ask God's forgiveness, we turn back toward him again and we seek his face. And whenever we do all of this as followers of Jesus Christ... He gives us a promise. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That is some great promises there. But I want to help you out with one more thing. You know that part about seeking his face that I just mentioned again multiple times over over the last few minutes? There is one thing that that I didn't really get into and I said that I was going to come back to it. When we humble ourselves before God, we put ourselves in a posture of recognizing that he is greater than us, right? How great is God? I want you to think about that for just a moment. How great is God? Is he greater than the universe? Is he greater than you? Is he greater than the coronavirus? See, I have to wonder if this coronavirus has not been used as a judgment, if it's not one of those pestilence or plagues that were talked about in verse 13. I wonder if indeed God's not using that to try and draw believers back to himself. To say, stop looking at the world. let's, Let's be honest about this. If we as believers contract the coronavirus, what's the worst that can happen? Have you thought about it yet? Death? Do you truly believe in God? And do you believe that indeed what Jesus said is true, that behold, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back to take you there with me. If he's going to come back, And take us with him. If Jesus indeed died upon the cross, and if you're a believer in Jesus, you do. 
If we believe that not only he died on the cross for our sins, but that he rose again from the dead and then ascended to the Father, and that bodily, if we believe those things, then we have to understand that the worst thing that can happen to us right now with this coronavirus is death. But guess what? That wasn't the end for Jesus, and that will not be the end for us. And thereby, if we are followers of Jesus, then what is the worst thing that can happen to us? Death is not a terrible thing. In fact, the psalmist says that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that God's wanting us all to to die from this. Instead, the reason it would be precious is because we will be in his presence completely, eternally. We will have the joy of being able to worship at his feet. It also helps us to understand that we don't need to walk throughout this life in fear. We don't have to worry about this coronavirus. And indeed, this this verse, these verses, help us to understand that it is our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ, as the people of God, that we so desperately need to walk throughout this life, not with fear, but in courage and faith. That does not mean that we need to go out and start... Breaking this, uh, the, the isolation or the social distancing, if you will. But it also means that whenever we see someone else around us that's coughing, that we don't run away from them. Maybe what it means is that we offer a glass of cold water to them. If we see somebody that's not doing well, maybe what it means is that we offer to help them get assistance that they need regardless of the case we as the people of God need to stop being afraid of what can kill this body but cannot destroy our soul in hell and if indeed you are not a follower of Jesus Christ but you have come upon this service and might I offer this, I'm not trying to scare you into the kingdom in the least. But what I want to offer is that Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, the word that is used for only begotten, if you use the, uh, the King James Version, it's a Greek word meaning very unique, truly one and only History shows that Jesus did come to the earth. This man named Jesus did die and he had this amazing following. And if you were to look and see the following of people, Jesus didn't look for the elites. He looked for people that were willing, had a willing heart for him. I invite you to come and be a part of his family because he does. He extends that offer. But you've got to lay down your own life. Scripture says that we will either be a slave of sin or we'll be a slave of righteousness. There's no in-between and there is no other. So what are you going to choose to do? Will you follow Jesus? Will you walk throughout this life and have a confidence that you need not fear? I'd like to close out in prayer. And before I do though, let me offer this. That if indeed you are seeking and you would like to have a little bit more information about it or you would like to, uh, to know more about what it means to follow Jesus or what it means to be a, a child of God, then send us a Facebook message. If you are 
a part of the family of God, then I would encourage you to get together with other believers throughout this week and every week going forward and not only pray asking for God's forgiveness, but that likewise you would spend time in prayer and and in self-reflection seeking how it is that you have violated God's commands. Let's pray. Gracious God, indeed, you are holy. And we recognize, God, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. We ask of your forgiveness, God. We ask of your forgiveness because we as individuals have so often sought after our own desires. We have tried so often as not just individuals but as a corporate body to be acceptable by the culture around us instead of following faithfully to your word and sharing the good news with others. Lord, too often we have been so legalistic and rigid that we have not been gracious where people have failed to meet up to the litmus test of what your, uh, your word has to say, what the scriptures have to say. God, too often we have capitulated to the society around us. We have encouraged abortion for those that have gotten pregnant out of wedlock or have been raped or abused in some way. And Lord, we don't see that as being a good thing. It is heartbreaking for us that there is any form of abuse. But abortion is never the right way, God. Two wrongs in our common vernacular today, two wrongs do not make a right. God, in our churches today, We have encouraged homosexual activity. We have told people that it's okay, but God, it's not. Your word proclaims that you made us male and female and that we are supposed to follow you faithfully. God, we have encouraged our leaders to lie publicly We laugh whenever people make statements that are not good. We use filthy language. Our hearts are impure. God, we have allowed and encouraged pornography and and sex trafficking and all kinds of different things that have taken place. Father, we ask of your forgiveness. We ask that you would help us to be your people, called by your name. We ask, God, that you would forgive us for our sins. Forgive our unrighteousness. Cleanse us and heal our land. We trust, God, that indeed you are hearing from heaven. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. We're so glad that you were here with us today at Beach. Uh, If you will, we've got one more hymn that we're going to join together with. It is, To God Be the Glory. God bless you. Yep. Redemption, the purpose.
Stop. 